We are we are being recorded now. <laughs> there exists a set of measure. So another thing that your proof does is it, although it's not apparent actually from your write-up, but the thing we started with in doing it with one half is we started with a sequence that converged to one half, a specific sequence. And the first term of that sequence uh, uh, I think we did one fourth plus an eighth plus a sixteenth and so on. And so what we did was, in a way, uh, we left off a fourth, then we left off an eighth, then we left off a sixteenth and so on. And so what was left was a half. And the one fourth that we left off, I mean, the, the three fourths or the one fourth of that sequence or that series represents the measure of, step back just a little bit, Emma. It, it represents the intervals, the first two intervals the, that go to the right-hand side, the non-special intervals. Those two non-special intervals map are gonna to map to a set that has measure one fourth. And then the next two special intervals will map to the right-hand side of the zero and one squares. And so you'll leave those off as well. Does this make sense? Mm -hmm. So if, right now, if you use the exact same proof that you already have after the first step, you don't have much measure total. You have only a total measure you could possibly use of a quarter. So the largest thing that could map to there could have measure a quarter. Are we good? Mm -hmm. So let's see if we can do it with something. For example, an eighth, could you, could you get a set of measure one half to go to the x equals zero line and a measure one eighth to go to the x equal one line. Could you do that? This is a quarter. You want to get to one eighth. You want to find the series that converges to one eighth. Well, they're both one eighth, right? Mm -hmm. So we could just look at a, a smaller version of our full zero to one interval. It's like the same splitting pattern. It's just like one eighth the size. Yeah. So our large pattern converges to one half. Our 
two and three are both going to converge to one sixteenth. So that's one half times one eighth because like the length is one eighth as long. Okay. Sorry, we're going to remove one fourth of one eighth first, right? Yep. Which is one thirty second. second. So that's one sixty fourth to each tiny little. Next for remove a total of one. Wait, that's one sixty fourth. So that's one one twenty eight. Would it help to write it instead of two? Well, no, two times one twenty four. Is that two squared then times? Oh, yeah, I don't know. Wait, because now we're looking at instead of two sections, we're looking at four right. sections, and then if we then that might be easier because then we just have to think about the measure of each of you. Do you want me to write four times one over 64? Um, so the first one would be two times one eighth. I don't know if that makes it easier or harder. That might be because this would be eight, right? And then Monkey, are you looking for specifics or just kind of in general if this is possible? Um, well, I think a little of both. I want to know whether or not you think this is possible, but then we're going to be we're going to want to write it up. Okay. okay. My my thought is that this little little bit is like sort of identical to the zero to one chunk just scaled down by a yeah. factor of three that's what it looks like to me too and so for the same reason that from three fourths we can derive one half if we did the same thing scaled down by three we'd get what is that one sixth from this mm -hmm. yeah what i mean so, making it one eighth is i don't know yeah so um so did you say scale down for, uh, what was that again, Luke? How did that go? Scale down? Yeah. These two little intervals or sub intervals, if you want to call it, are kind of, they store the same amount of information as the zero and one sub intervals, but just take up less space. Yeah. So the same sort of chunking can be used here, just scaled down by a factor of three which is three fourths, or sorry, one fourth divided by three fourths. One fourth. That was kind of arbitrary what I said, or not arbitrary, but yeah, just though the ratio of their lengths is three to one. Yep, I see. Yeah. 
I see. So the um, let's erase, erase that range picture for a minute, Emma, and let's draw just the big square up again. And we want to do things inductively here. And let's just draw the vertical line right in the middle. The, yeah, the x equal one half line. At the end of the first stage of your construction, how much is mapping to the left and how much is mapping to the right? Three quarters and one quarter. OK, so uh, let's somewhere on there, put the three quarters and one quarter. And now divide the left-hand rectangle into two. No, no, uh, vertically. vertically. Yep, vertically. Okay. Now at the end of the second stage, how much goes to the left-hand column? Three-eighths. That's five-eighths. Five-eighths. Five-eighths, yeah. And so how much is in the goes to the right hand column of that? Three eighths. Oh. Yes. Because three quarters or six eighths goes to the entire left hand half. Yeah. And so I think only one eighth goes to that section right there is that right yeah okay and then in the next stage how much divide that left hand column into two again now how much measure is mapping into that at the end of the next stage um, six. Yeah. So that's just a 16th more than a half, right? Yes. So what we're seeing here is that if you look at the stages, the stuff that is mapping into those consecutive halves of the rectangles gives you a sequence that converges to one half. And that's why the if you look at the inverse image of those rectangles, that's the stuff that maps into it, and measure those, then those measures are converging to one half. And so that's the stuff that maps to x equals zero. And I think what Luke was saying is we can play that same game on the right, but we don't have quite so much measure. On the right hand side, to begin with, we only have a quarter. But if we divide that into vertically, we need something that goes there and the rest goes there. And using the same idea, exactly, we can just scale down. We can do that same thing so that we could eventually get an eighth to map to the line x equals one. Did I hear you right, Luke? Is that what you're saying here? I, I think it'll, if we follow it, like if we do the same ratios, I think it would be one sixth. Oh, one sixth, okay. So I, I agree that I think, I think that might, I think that that looks reasonable to me that that's what can, that's what can happen. It, it will take some proof. But I think, I think that can, that looks reasonable to me. Let's, let's erase your right hand picture once again, Emma, if you don't mind. 
And let's draw up the exact same picture again. And let's make measure one half go to x equals zero, just like before. Now let's draw right in the middle of that. Yeah, right in the middle. In order to get a half to go there, how much needs to go into that entire left-hand side? What is the minimum amount that, can, that you can put in that left-hand side and still have one, a measure one half set go to x equals zero? Last time we had three quarters. Could you do less than three quarters, do you suppose? Yes. How much less than three quarters? Almost a quarter. Yeah, that's perfect. It, because for the same reason that Luke gave before, you can't put exactly a half there, or there won't be anything left for those other lines. Mm -hmm. So uh, probably anything bigger than a half. And so probably anything less than a half, you could leave for the other side. That, that sort of looks likely to me. Exactly from the construction that you guys already did. Now, suppose we did that. Suppose you had a half go to the x equals zero, and suppose you had a quarter go to the x equal one. Would, then you would have something left potentially for x equal one half line. Mm -hmm. And if you didn't use everything, then potentially you'd have something left for the x equal one quarter line. And if you didn't take everything, it's something left for the x equals three quarters line and so on. So that's exactly my thinking for why you could do it for countable collections. First of all, any finite collection looks like basically you just leave a little bit left over and you've got some stuff to work with. The reason I said countable is it could very well be that you could do a in math induction somehow and leave a little bit left for each of a countable collection of lines. Does any of this sound reasonable? Or there's a lot to do, but that's what kind of looks reasonable to me. I think it is. And I, th I think that would be a, that would be a very nice result if you could prove that. We want to prove this. We're trying to prove that we can map a set of measure one to a countable collection. Um, it, yeah. Uh, I guess you would say that, Luke. I guess you would say that. But I think, I think. This is a step-by-step -step process. So I think the next step is to do two lines and then maybe three lines. Um, and then after that, the next step would be to try to write an induction. And my guess is that uh, 
horizontal and vertical lines are going to be kind of what we will look at, but probably the result would work for any countable collection of lines you could do it on. But right now for skew lines, I don't know how we would deal with that easily. But for horizontal and vertical lines, I think we can. So I think the next step is to do two. Maybe x equals zero and x equal one. I, I sent you some comments on last week's homework, and I thought we could, I would like to take a little time to look at some of those. If that would be okay. And they they should be in the email, so we can kind of look at them together and, and I can share my screen, I guess. Uh, unfortunately, Am I sharing it all? Can you see anything? Yes. So this is basically your stuff. And I, I put in some comments. Uh, so I just thought we'd go through those a little bit. Um, so statement theorem point one. And uh, what you are actually doing is you are describing a part partitioning of the range to begin with. And uh, so I added the partitioning because the range is just zero one squared unit square. So there's not much to describe that, but what we are really describing is a partitioning of it. And you're going to do it inductively. So everything looks good for congruent subsquares, then the labeling of those subsquares and so on. In the second paragraph, then, we're going to do the induction. We assume at stage n, the unit square has been partitioned into four to the n subsquares, each with a unique label, a sub sigma. And then instead of from, I put where sigma is in sigma 4n. Uh, and uh, it each of these has a unique label and a pattern. And I added the L of sigma, the pattern of sigma, L being the pattern. So the pattern of sigma is one of these guys. And then um, the next sentence, the A sub and then the sigma 4n plus 1 is not, uh, that sort of doesn't, uh, makes sense in a way, because the things that are subscripts of the A's are elements of that set. So capital sigma for N consists of all uh, sequences that are four long. So they're four digits long. Or, I mean, they're N digits long, and they consist of the digits 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, uh, 0, 1, 2, 3, the first four digits beginning with 0. So that's just notate that capital sigma is just notation for that. And uh, so I scratched that line and but then continued our next line. For each sigma in sigma 4n, we partition, and you want to say what you're partitioning. We partition a sigma, which has already been defined, into four congruent subsquares. There's only one way to do that, so that's well defined. These subsquares will be labeled sigma 0, sigma 1, sigma 2, sigma 3. Uh oh, hang on for a second. OK. 
Okay. So that's what we're going to do. These four subscores are labeled like this, depending on their location relative to the pattern uh, L sigma of A sigma. So what you wrote was not wrong. I just added the pattern for it. Furthermore, each of these subsquares will be granted a pattern based on, and uh, it should be based on table one, I think. So maybe I didn't reference that. I, I think I should have said based on table one rather than just one. Should And in the code, I used ref for that. And with the C, S-E-E, -E, one table one, that first number one there is a citation. So I added a, some bibliographic citations to this, which I'll show in a minute. I, I also sent you the LaTeX code for all of this so you can see it. Yeah, and, and then down here, uh, I put the citation with the page number. So that C1, page 102, that is a citation. And then I redid this next sentence. Thus, the collection of all A sigma, where sigma is now in the n plus one length sequences, uh, that collection is a partition of this. And each of these is defined. It's one longer than the ones before. And it's defined because of this line up above, where these are the ones that are one longer than the nth ones. So if sigma is n long, then sigma 0, sigma 1, sigma 2, and sigma 3 are n plus 1 long. And, and everything that's n plus 1 long is of that form. And that completes the inductive definition of these a sigmas. With that, we've defined the inductive process to identify these subsquares for any natural number n. So these, I think, are just minor changes, but they're changes in a way that uh, have some importance. And now you want to describe a corresponding partition of the domain. And this is, this is your key. This, I didn't have a lot of time to go through this, but this needs a little bit of work, too, to rewrite this carefully so that these... <clears throat> <clears throat> these I sub sigmas are uh, well defined. So uh, we need these to be well defined at each case, and we need special ones, which you've talked about. And the special ones are the ones corresponding to the S, the A sigmas that contain the line that you're interested in. So there's table one. And the second line of this page says, this process continues. And I mean, that is true, but in this case, you want to carefully define what it means for this process to continue. And that means another induction is going on here. So I think this part needs to be written up carefully using induction. Um, and you need another citation telling sort of how this works. But uh, now here is table five. But this, this can refer back to another paper, but it, this should be your table two, I think. The next, the next paragraph is the engine behind this measuring, which, which is good. But um, there are some issues. You, you need to verify, first of all, what you have here. You need to verify that the total, that each of the um, 
two to the n special intervals has this length that needs proof. And you need to show that the sum of those two to the n ones is this, that are removed. Um, and this, this should actually be a sequence. This converges to one half. Observe that the total measure of the non-special intervals left behind is one half. That is not exactly true because it depends on what you mean by total measure, but this is a countable process. It's an infinite process. And when you're done, you don't have any intervals left. Um, oh, wait. Observe that the total measure of the non, uh huh. So I think you mean maybe the total measure of the union of the non special intervals. Yeah, so this, this needs clarity, but um, this is the idea that you're measuring the complement. And the non special intervals are the ones that map to the complement. Anything that's non-special maps to the complement. Anything, and and so that total measure is one half. This is kind of a key idea in generalizing, the fact that it's the complement that is that you're actually measuring in this process. All right. Um, The next step is to do the space base idea, which is which is good here. But there last time we breezed over kind of an issue, and that is that some x's are in two intervals. For, for example, i0 intersect i1 is a point. So any point that is on the intersection of two intervals there's a choice for the uh, sort of the space-based decimal expansion. And um, so I think it is best to define a specific sequence of these, given any X, define with some specificity. So if X is only in one of intervals at stage N, then it's easy. There, is no choice, but if X is in two, make a choice. Um, and then, <clears throat> and then down here, this is the definition of the space filling curve. The fact that it's space filling um, has to do with the fact that the partitions that you've used satisfy three conditions. And they are uh, the diameter of the partition elements goes to zero. That's one of the conditions. And adjacent uh, partition elements uh, are geometrically adjacent. Uh, and and so on. So I think I think you need to mention what those conditions are, and mention that your partitions that you've defined uh, actually do that, which they do. So this is sort of an omission rather than anything else. But I think at that point, this this is pretty much a proof. And I added these guys as references. Will there will be other references we'll want to add along the way? You might want to add your measure theory book as a uh, as a reference also in this. Does this make sense? We good? And you learned some Tixie. That was nice. So I think the first theorem 
that you have. Uh, now, I think you want to make that proof clean. So it's really clean and accurate. And then you want to see uh, for next week whether or not you can generalize that. How much does it generalize? Can you actually specify exactly what measure goes to x equals zero line? Another way to generalize it is just with one line, instead of the x equals zero line, could it be any line, any vertical line or any horizontal line? Could you do the same thing? And then I think the direction to go is to, uh, is to move to a second line at some point. Does, does this make sense? Are we good? You know, there uh, when when I'm doing this, it, there you can kind of think, um, oh man, there's always more. Humpy always wants more and more. But what you guys have done already is really good. That is really a good start. So you're kind of you've kind of. Uh, put your finger on some important ways to think about this already. And it, it looks like from what you wrote up that, that you really know this, how this worked. So that, that really is good. The fact that there's always more, it's a fact of life in mathematics. I mean, <laughs> there, there's always more. <laughs> and we wanna see how far these ideas that you've expressed already, you want to see how far they can, they can push the envelope. And I think from what Emma was doing on the board today, you kind of get the idea that they can push the envelope pretty far. And I kind of gave, when I said what I thought was the goal, I think that's, it looks like the envelope could be pushed that far anyway. And to do that, we'll, I mean, it'll take some work to think through these, to get all the numbers figured out correctly. It'll be, it's, it, it gets to be a technical nightmare in a way, but um, don't try to do it all at once. So I think the goal for next week is to generalize with the theorem that you have and, <clears throat> and uh, in one of two ways is, is really good. If you have a little more time, add another line and see if you can do that. Isabel, your test was negative, I see. Yes, it was. <laughs> How is the gang working together as a group? Good. We've Good? been meeting like twice outside of this per week. Your latex pretty good too. I mean, <laughs> But what you wrote was pretty good. Yay. Yeah. Yeah. 
Questions? Do you guys have some questions? Some anything else you want to talk about right now? For the space-based stuff. Yeah. I, I tried to address the um the possibility that an X is in two partitions. And um I tried to just say like take take the leftmost of the two, if you will. Like I said, if if X is in multiple intervals, just take the digit that's the least of the indices of the intervals. Oh, let me take a look at that here. Well, so that, that would be good. I mean, um, I didn't... Um, I'm looking for the paper right now. I don't know what I did with it here. So I'm, I'll reopen it. Um, but I was kind of looking for that, but I must have missed it. Oh, yes. Uh, be the least of the two. That works. Yeah, that should work, Luke. Yeah, sorry, I, I didn't uh, I didn't observe that right away, but yeah, that should work. Is the wording all right, or should I try to express it differently? No, I think I think the wording is fine. Okay, cool. So um, I think in the red that I wrote there, I wanted to define this sigma sub x. And that is this decimal. That is sort of the space-based decimal. x of 0, x of 1, x of 2. And x of 0 is, or x of n is what you have defined up above. You didn't give it a name, but you have defined uh, x as a function, the nth digit of x, if you want, x of n. So I think yeah. that's, that's useful notation here because this is really a decimal and the x of n's I'm not sharing anymore, but I'm pointing to it on my screen. <laughs> Oh, let's see. Yeah, right, right here is the uh, X of zero, X of one and so on. That's what you are basically defining up here. Okay. I gave a name to it. And then the sequence for X, that's the left-hand side of this, sigma sub X, the entire sequence is, you could write as this decimal. I wrote it in decimal form and, and you could put an SP, uh, SB here for space base, but this is the, the decimal then. And if you define it uh, using the least of the two, if it happens to be in two, then, then this should be good to go.
And what you're doing here is kind of the inductive thing, given this. Uh, in a way, you, you don't have to define this inductively since you know what the INs are, but you do need to show that, uh, you do need to say something about the fact that this expansion, the space-based expansion is unique. There's only one way to do it. But here, I think you're doing a, an induction in a way that um, that is in a way not necessary. You already know what the INs are. You know that they are partition. So you know that in each X is in either a unique one or it's in two. And if it's in two, you've told what to do. So I think just this line up here, these three sentences here are enough. And what you called A1 is what I called X of zero. So um, for the instance of our, just what we made here, the point, let's say three eighths is in I sub zero and I sub one, correct? Yep. But it is also in I sub zero three and I sub one zero, right? Uh, I sub zero three and I sub one zero. Oh yes, yeah, you're right. More is necessary. Yeah, you don't always want to take. Yeah, you may want to do it inductively. Look. Because you don't always want to take the least. It won't it won't give you the right value. Yep. So I, I think there there is a little work to do down here. And uh, if there are multiple intervals, we let this be the least of the two. I, I don't think you want to do that. If it's the left-hand endpoint, you want to take the least of the two. If it's the right-hand endpoint, you want to take the greater of the two. Maybe it's that. Oh, okay. Yeah, all right. <clears throat> but it's nice to straighten, uh, get this straightened out because it's really nice to work uh, with those expansions if, if you want. They, they really tell you how it works. Sorry for prying more here. Like the point in, in the middle of interval I zero, for instance. Yes. Like I, I feel like every point is, is in infinite I sub something. It's not just one. You know, like if we had just some point lying in the middle of I zero. Yeah. Um, how would you define that not inductively? Um, let, let's see if I can use my iPad here. All right, we're gonna stop screen sharing here. And I'll, I'll try to screen share again.
Hmm. Oh, it's not letting me screen share this time. Let me try once again here. All right, I'm, I may be uh, doing this, we'll see. So uh, here's zero, here's one. Are you seeing anything, Luke? Yes. Okay. So here we have I0, I1, I2, and I3. There they are. And um, you want to take a point somewhere in the middle here. Uh -oh, what's going on here? My pen seems to have quit working. This whole thing's a nightmare right now. Could be my pen is out. Well, shoot. Technical nightmare here. We're going to stop sharing. And um, uh, Emma, would you mind going to the board again and doing this? Yep. Yeah. We'll just, we, we just want a unit interval somewhere. And then I0, I1, and I2 up there. And, and now in uh, a different color, put a point that's sort of in the middle of I1 somewhere. Um, can someone rotate okay. me? Okay. Uh, you want a point in the middle of I1? Yeah, maybe in a different color, just make a dot. Yeah, so that, and label that as X. And now we want the space base for x and it begins with x equals and the very first one will be uh, point one and now uh, we can't see what it is for the next one yet we have to subdivide i1 so this 
doesn't have to be according to your formula. This can be any subdivision, but let's subdivide so that X is not an endpoint. So just subdivide I1. Did you do four things there? We should have, know. yeah. And then they are labeled left to right, uh, one zero, one one, one two, and one three. And which one is X in? One one. So if it's in one one, then uh, then the next then the next one is a one. Okay. So that's the process, unless X ends up to be a uh, an endpoint of one of them. So down below, write a, an entire, uh, a big interval again. And then uh, put just one point in the middle of it somewhere. In a different color. Yeah, it can be in a different color. This is gonna be our X, but it's also gonna be an end point. So the left-hand side will be uh, X. Uh, let's write the left-hand side is I sub sigma. And let's put on the right-hand side, I, uh, on the right-hand side of X, I sub sigma star. And sigma star will mean whatever the successor of sigma is, the next one. And so now uh, X will equal, in this case, dot sigma. And then after the sigma will be uh, three, 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 three. And little bar over the threes to indicate it continues equals dot sigma star zero 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 continuing in zeros. I think those are the only cases. If it's uniquely in one, then that's what you write down. And then the next one will be that sigma plus the next digit, whichever it's in, unique or not. If it at some point it is not unique, then there is a first point at which it's not unique. And that's the one I've drawn here. And the situation is that you have an, on the left, you have a I sigma and on the right, you have an I and then sigma, whatever comes after sigma. It's, it's uh, arithmetic base four. I guess it can't be a four. I mean, uh, zero, one, two, three. It can't be a. Th it can't be a three. Sigma can end in a three, but sigma star cannot begin. I don't know. This is it. And then, and now X. Once that happens, then you can tell exactly what all the rest of them are. Either they are sigma and then end in threes, or they're sigma star and end in zeros. This is what it looks like to me, Luke. I could be wrong, but this is kind of what it looks like. Well, I, I certainly agree. I just, I didn't really know how to describe it without going in that way. I think I'll just have to try writing something a little different and seeing how it goes. Yeah. And even if you wrote kind of what happens here, that's, I mean, that's sort of it. It's getting late, you guys. I don't want to keep you too late here. 
but I also don't want to cut off any questions. So, anything else that we've got? Oh, sure. <laughs> Emma, Abby, Isabel, got enough to cook on for a week? If not, so. you yeah. fall. <laughs> yeah. All right, next next week I'll still be in California, but not in the same place. So how is the baby? Oh man. <laughs> <laughs> We've had a good time. We took him for a walk yesterday. There's a it was 70 degrees out. So we took him for a walk in a little park that they're making um it was an old nursery and they've turned it into a, a uh, or they're in the process of turning it into a, a park with a bunch of uh, specimens of West Coast trees and shrubs and stuff. And it, it was just great. He went to sleep, had a great time. Um, I mean, the dude's yeah. only 11 days old, but he's having a good time. <laughs> All all functions are go. <laughs> so, yeah, so it's really been fun. And our, our granddaughter, his sister is um, just a little over two now. So uh, she goes to a little Montessori school during the day and I've been taking her to school oh. in the wagon. <laughs> so, yeah. Yep, we were counting steps today, a little early math. <laughs> That's really been nice. Thanks for asking. Yeah. <laughs> All right. So I'll see you next week. Feel free to give me a call or, or write me an email with any questions. But um, I mean, what you've done so far is, is, is really good. So I'm, I'm excited about progress. Yay. Don't, don't let it go to your head though, I mean. <laughs> All right, see you next week. Stay That's away good. from those positive tests. We'll try. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks. Bye. Bye. See you.